Morning all. I'd just like to say as a prelude, uh, I'm showing you know Fisher Gaines whether he sometimes wins, sometimes loses and, and sometimes draws because uh, I really want to show his evolution through to the dramatic 1972 World Championship match. So that's why I thought it would be interesting to revisit some of the very, very strong candidates tournaments. Fisher, Kasparov, Tao, these, these three players are among um, my absolute favourite players of all time and it's interesting to see how they evolved. At the time of this tournament, Fisher was 19 years old, I believe. Quite a lanky, a tall 19 year old. And he's playing cautionary now for the third time. In this grueling tournament, played in Cur Curacao in 1962. This is the 8th of June. Uh, so Cautionoy had, in their earlier encounter in this tournament, uh, had a good position, as we saw, in the King's Engine defence. He chose, chose a Fianchetto variation, he had won a pawn, and then there was a catastrophic blunder. So could Cautionoy actually recover and regroup for this this battle? He had the black pieces here. Cautionoy, just, just as a reminder, uh, is a professional chess player author, and until recently, um, the oldest active grandmaster on the tournament circuit. He is widely regarded as the strongest player never to have become world chess champion. Born in Leningrad, USSR, cautionally defected to the Netherlands in 1976 and has been residing in Switzerland for many years. He played three matches against Anatoly Karpov. In 1974, he lost the candidate's final to Karpov, who de declared world champion in 1975, when Bobby Fischer refused to defend his title. He then won two consecutive candidate cycles to qualify for World Championship matches with Karpov in 1978 and 81, losing both. Korshnoy was a candidate for the World Championship on 10 occasions. So 1962, as we're seeing here in this Curacao, Curacao tournament, 1968, 71, 74, 77, 80, 83, 85, 88 and 91. He was also a four times USSR chess champion, a five times member of Soviet teams, that won the European Championship and a six-time member of Soviet teams that won the Chess Olympiad. In September 2006, he won the World Senior Chess Championship. So in this game, Viktor Korshnoi is black playing against Fischer. So Fischer kicked off with e4 and Viktor played the Sicilian defence. None of this uh, Khan business which Fischer experienced in the previous um, candidates tournament. 1959. No, he's playing the sharp Sicilian defence and daring to allow Fischer to play the fischer sozin attack system. So Fischer's repertoire was very, very detailed on very specific lines. This was going into, you know, one of Fischer's great uh, theoretical strengths throughout his career. This fischer sozin attack variation, which has scored very, very well for Fischer. So this is characterised by this bishop c4 move here. And the bishop now drops back to b3. So often the diagonal is blasted open with a later f4 and f5 to really blast that bishop on this diagonal. We see bishop e7. Both sides now castle. Bishop e3 is played here. Supporting that knight on d4, which frees up the queen if, it, if she wants to go to queen e2. That's now possible, or somewhere else that's possible. So bishop e3. Let's have a quick look at live book. Bishop e3 is the most common move, 208 games. King h1, 43 games here. So bishop e3. And in the game, we see a bit of a rare bird, actually. The most common move, which which probably a lot of Fisher opponents played before, was a6. We've got 156 games here in, in chess space live, but bishop d7, 77. But this next move, a bit of a rarer bird. Uh, knight a5 was played. So what does this really mean? Uh, for this bishop, I just outlined one of the plans of f4, f5 is to liberate this bishop, but it's the option for black to just snap it up now, and he, a3 can be exterminated with knight takes b3. Is this a downside? The knight was doing a job of putting the brakes on e5 though, surely on c6 there's a downside to taking on b3, and what about the queen side pressure? Black's got these two pawns here, and the knight was part of the defence of these pawns. Surely this bishop and this rook don't want to be glaring down at a7 or this pawn to be subject of scrutiny later. So maybe there is some queenside pressure downside to factor in here with snapping off this dangerous bishop. In this position, f4 is played anyway because 
f5 not just liberates the bishop but also if e5 you know the d5 square will be in white's grip and we see now a very very interesting move which is the most common move not a6 but actually perhaps this works a little bit better with the move knight a5 the move b6 is played so what is this doing the move b6 bishop b7 and black will be exerting some influence on the light squares is there also a possibility maybe a bishop a6 as well but um you know the quick b6 instead of a6 so that a6 square is available to black in theory as well and in fact that now comes up as a potential um idea for black here so these two possibilities are not ruled out by the move b6 but ordinarily we'd see a plan of a6 here uh, on live book um, you'd think in most positions but here actually the most common move is actually b6 22 games a6 16 games um, does a6 actually work with knight a5 just for those interested here's an example an e5 break I think um, this is starting to get a little bit on the dangerous side for black but black could snap up here we have a different game f5 it looks a little bit dangerous but uh, that's that's an interesting kind of continuation so a6 might be playable it is quite popular as well but we see the move b6 which is actually the most popular move here and Fisher now does actually play e5 not f5 but e5 in this position so maybe trying to punish you know this knight is not putting the brakes on e5 so what is going on here where can the knight go it hasn't got too many squares white controls very well d5 for the moment um, if knight takes b3 now we can just surely we can just take on f6 just winning material so the knight really is pushed back here if it goes to d7 let's try knight d7 I think this runs into something horrible e takes and now black's best is bishop f6 if bishop takes d6 there is something very horrible here knight takes e6 attacking the queen uh, winning material queen e7 is best of taking this is just a disaster because of queen takes d6 so the pressure down the d file is is potentially a, a menace here so black has to play the accurate an accurate move uh, possibly d takes e5 is playable knight e8 is playable and is played and now we see the move f5 which I believe might be one of the most accurate moves in the position uh, really putting a lot of pressure on black and even f6 and f takes they both seem like dangerous uh, frets here as well as e takes as well so there's a lot of tension here a lot of pawn tension uh, for what's going to happen next okay so in this position black to play Victor plays uh, I think it's one of the best moves according to uh, engines here D takes e5 okay D takes e5 if he had played Knight takes b3 let's let's show this actually white can do well in this position by not taking on b3 that that's nothing to, but actually play Knight c6 now taking on e7 and here now f6 is very very dangerous this might actually be uh, winning for white this is a very dangerous uh, pawn indeed um, and in fact this rook entrance could also contribute to white's attack here this looks like a very good attack building up okay so this is a kind of position black should avoid so perhaps very wisely uh, in this position um, after f5 knight takes b3 was not played by Victor Korshoi instead he plays d takes e5 and now Fisher played f takes e6 and at this very moment now knight takes b3 is played inviting uh, it seems you know maybe a little bit provocative you might think e takes f7 the king's going to come out to play a little bit or is it after rook takes f7 if rook takes f7 here no actually knight takes a1 is possible 
and black's doing okay very well in fact so knight takes b3 now white to play okay the routine recapture I don't think is as good as what Fisher played if a takes b3 well just e takes d4 and black's just winning loads of material so knight c6 is the idea encouraging queen takes d1 for knight takes e7 so queen takes d1 is not a good idea at all here knight takes e7 check rook a takes d1 and white's absolutely winning this position so the idea knight c6 it seems quite frightening but there's one very very accurate move now which shows black can survive this position queen d6 is the move uh, do other moves actually lose for sure if queen c7 doesn't that just invite knight d5 because if queen takes then knight takes e7 end of game so queen d6 is probably box move only move the old informator symbols so queen d6 Fisher now takes that queen bishop takes and now takes on b3 so the smoke's cleared and what do we have we have now after bishop takes e6 a situation where these pawns do seem very uh, vulnerable uh, to this blasting rook on the a file so the nature of the position has changed away from attacking kings to what something else to, to queen side um, pressure and potential you know dangerous past pawns which would logically result if these two pawns could be eliminated uh, the question is how to eliminate um, these pawns there's two ways here Fisher chose knight takes a7 but another way is possibly bishop takes b6 and now just taking this one and this does seem to promise uh, white um, an advantage the bishop is, is that got very few squares though okay bishop if bishop e3 that should be okay as well for white white looks to be doing very well in this position in theory so bishop takes b6 does seem to be uh, another alternative uh, for for black black has to tread very carefully perhaps with knight f6 if we have a look at knight f6 here knight takes a7 rook fb8 and black has a certain pressure here which might be okay if bishop f2 knight g4 so there's some compensation for white winning uh, these two poor pawns on the queen side this is actually starting to be um, showing uh, some compensation for black this type of position it's not so clear uh, also these are double pawns anyway so okay the way Fisher played this was actually knight takes a7 which is also promising and b6 is under fire that's now protected and it's put under fire again with rook a6 and now the b6 pawn is sacrificed with knight f6 so okay rook takes b6 we have a situation where now Fisher is the one a pawn up uh, so like in their previous uh, round encounter in this tournament cautionary was a pawn up so does does a pawn up mean a guaranteed win or not well these are double pawns let's see what happens rook takes b6 bishop takes b6 and we see rook b8 whereas the bishop where does the bishop want to go back if it goes back to e3 well if it goes to a5 total disaster just check winning the knight it must stay on that diagonal if it goes to e3 it's subject to harassment surely with knight g4 so it, it wants to go here to f2 that's virtually the only move so we have this clearer situation now of outcome the outcome is white's a pawn up black's got the bishop pair black's also got this pass pawn as compensation maybe for white's potential pass pawns this e pawn and if you look at this there's a four to two on this side of the board if these pawns were somehow wiped out 
So it's an interesting scene at this point in the game. And Black now is trying to eliminate Fisher's dark square bishop with the move knight g4. So there's some time and regrouping needed as part of winning this material on the queen side. And that these pieces that one material need to be re-centralized and they're slightly exposed to attacks. Now here we see knight ab5 attacking this bishop in return. And the bishop goes to b4. So does Fisher want to keep his dark squared bishop? Yes, he does. He plays bishop a7. And we see rook b7, which now threatens bishop takes c3. And if knight takes, then rook takes a7. Okay, so a tactical moment in this game. Uh, so bishop takes c3 needs to be responded to, or does it? Fisher could play rook a1 just to support that bishop, but instead he counterattacks one of white's pieces. Okay, what's going on here? Now bishop takes c3 is played, b takes c3, rook takes b5, for h takes g4. Why is Fisher sacrificed? Another one of his king side pawns after bishop takes g4. We have here now a four to one potentially on this side of the board. Uh, but white has these pass pawns here potentially as a mass going forward. And in particular, the c pawn looks like a particular menace here. Opposite colored bishops as well to be factored in, which sometimes offers drawing chances, but sometimes it's very difficult to draw even with the opposite colored bishops. So we've got you know, cl a clearer picture of past pawn potential. But before we go into this, commit to this variation, what happened here after this h3, rook a8, was there anything else for black in this position? Not really. Um, and we saw, okay, after bishop takes c3, if knight takes c3, this isn't as good, I think. Takes. We're still going to pick up this pawn. Okay, so Fisher's h3. The, other, the only other alternative was this rook a1. Uh, another real alternative here against this threat of bishop c3. So it seems the material, the pieces used to pick up these queenside pawns are a bit fragile. This would address some fragility. Uh, but here, bishop takes c3. Knight takes c3. And white might actually be better than the game continuation, objectively. So rook a1 was actually something to seriously consider. I believe rook a1 is, is needs to be seriously considered. Bishop f5, that c2 pawn is a target though. And in this position, Okay, rook a8 potentially is a threat, but c2 remains a target. So this is slightly awkward and a bit passive looking for white. But again, technically, uh, this might be okay for white. So okay, let's commit to the game continuation now. So in the game continuation, we saw uh, that um, to, to, to respond to this uh, threat of bishop takes c3, rook a1 wasn't chosen, but in fact h3. So Fisher is in effect sacrificing another pawn over here, leaving a four to one potentially. But he's got his massive pawns on the queen side. So we go into this variation here. Bishop takes g4. So this c4 pawn, this c pawn rather, looks a menace. It's immediately pushed. Rook b7. Now rook a1. And these pawns are subject to attack here. Bishop f5. And now Fisher does does actually ignore this because he wants to accelerate his pawn queening here. If he played the move, say c3, let's try c3, then just rook takes b3, that's that's no good. So how else? He can't do this, surely, because maybe bishop takes c2. Actually, bishop takes c2, no, bishop c5, even stronger is just f6. Sort out any back row issues. And now, uh, Okay, an interesting position here. If c5, king f7, starts to look a little bit dangerous, 
But this pawn, this this is just overloaded for white this position because he's going to lose um, a pawn here. He can't hold on to that pawn, so he can't be too ambitious with this pawn here. Okay. So anyway, after Bishop F5, the more dynamic-looking C5 is played, just offering a C2 pawn. It looks absolutely logical to accelerate the C pawn to try and queen, um, and it's only a double pawn anyway. So maybe that's part of Fisher's reading, reasoning. You know, he wants to create pass pawns. Uh, Bishop takes C2, and now C6, attacking the rook, and Victor now plays rook takes B3. Okay, so we have a situation on the board now. Where this pawn seems to be getting uh, very, very dangerous indeed, and also the back row here is a, a bit worrisome for Black because he hasn't moved any of these pawns to give his king any luft. Uh, so there's two issues. It's not just the past pawn; it's the back row weakness. So you might think, well, okay, and this rules out, for example, if Rook C3. Pardon me. If if White plays C7. Which seems promising. Um, rook c3, the back row is emphasized with, say, bishop c5. And that also interferes with the rook on the queen. So uh, black has no time for this because the back row mate. So this is quite a dangerous position now. But uh, c7, is there an answer to c7? Well, the answer would be bishop f5. And in this situation, white should be okay. Rook c1, threatening c8, and black's best is to move one of the pawns here to allow c8, because uh, if he tries to block on c8, he'd actually be completely busted here uh, with just rook d1. The back row uh, mate is emphasized, and there's no defense in this position. Um, if f5, well, we've got this very, very dangerous pass pawn here. Um, now rook f8 as a threat, piece up. Uh, that's that's no good. So okay, so c7, um, however, might be uh, one of the best moves in this position. Arguably, at certain analysis depth, this does appear to be the move that white should try anyway, even though bishop f5 appears to come to the rescue. Um, if if uh, c7 bishop f5, by the way, uh, if we go with uh, rook c1, uh, g5, and white queens, we have a situation here where white's pawn here is quite significant in conjunction with the extra bishop. And this should be actually um, well, this is going to be a very difficult game for either side to win. Uh, it's not going to be that easy to use all the past pawns. It's, I would presume a logical outcome might be a draw, actually. It will be difficult for both sides to make progress. OK, so there's a critical difference here of this pawn on g2 in this position. Even though White's uh, won a piece, he needs that pawn on g2. But in the game, actually, uh, there was a s suggestion apparently from one of the reporters uh, spectating the game that if Bishop f5 is such an amazing resource, uh, well, a key resource to stop the pawn, then why not uh, play g4 first? And someone then posted some comments well, g4 can't be played because of rook g3 check. But in fact, shockingly, a little bit later, Fisher did actually play. Uh, in this in this position, um, so to uh, he doesn't play c7. He plays actually the move g4, which was uh, suggested by one of the spectators. So this is really testing now this rook g3 check. So what is going on here? Well, let's see. Rook g3 check, king f2. Rook takes g4. C two, C seven, Bishop F five, and the difference is Black has all these pawns ready to roll. 
bishop e3 we have a different a major difference of position now there's no pawn on g2 the bishops can still sacrifice itself so check c8 and this difference is very very unpleasant for white we have this armada of pawns here can this bishop really cope let's have a look look at how the game unfolded now h4 king f3 f5 just supporting the rook doesn't have to move yet rook f8 king g6 this is a very difficult force to defend without the pawn on g2 rook h8 check white is being driven back h3 okay e5 seems to be a target the king comes to protect it check king e4 rook e8 now just rook g5 and fisher realized his position is quite helpless now black has been making loads of progress and actually fisher was forced to resign now if he plays uh if he tries for the h3 pawn let's let's show an example either rook g2 or rook g g3 is very strong rook g2 rook g3 and you know black's going to come up with g5 these, these pawns there's no stopping them uh in this position you know rook h5 g5 the pawns are just just going forwards Let's, let's try rook h8 just as an example the pawns are just crashing through basically there's, there's no there's no real hope here the bishop is a little bit just helpless here as the pass pawns just just progress uh, that's it so we had actually a key blunder here so fisher with the extra pawn at one stage in the game um i maybe came a little bit over optimistic himself in this game to play the move g4 when you know it doesn't really rule out the bishop f5 resource because of you know check in taking then black still has time as we saw for for bishop f5 uh, there's no real improvement here it seems bishop c5 uh, the back row issue to be addressed check you know black still going to be playing bishop f5 to sacrifice the bishop so okay uh, so in the game a bit of a disaster there uh, with the move g4 that that g pawn is absolutely uh, critical uh, to have kept uh, on g2 here not to play the move g4 okay so um, that might have cheered uh, Victor up a bit and um, okay hope you got something from that comments or questions on YouTube Thanks very much.